The first conversation I had with John Elway was the night before I retired at the Super Bowl. We we were at a closed restaurant and we were drinking till about 1.30, 2 in the morning. And, That's late for you. Oh, totally. And uh, totally out of character. I mean, I and John and I spoke in, in those days, it wasn't my job to be friends with the people I was playing against. Day four of the Greenlight Road Trip. And as I mentioned, we did not have reliable internet at some of the last stops we we uh, we were rolling through. And now we are in Nashville and we are at the Bustin' with the Boys studio on the heels of the Beer Olympics or Beer Games, whatever they want to call it. It was a good time. Pulled up the RV in Taylor's yard. It's a beautiful place. The house is an Arc Digest looking house with a pool and a pond that Nate tried to clear the catfish out of until midnight when I told Taylor <laughs> that somebody was fishing in the pond. He was surprised. Um, and it was great. Great hospitality. Good group. Will Compton ended the night. Unable to unlock his phone. Uh, Taylor couldn't wake him up. I walked back to the RV about midnight and here we are uh, at the Bustin' with the Boys studio. So I'm right next to the uh, big Twisted T Bustin' with the boy, I mean, it's hideous. It's nothing like the RV we have parked outside. The Four Winds is gorgeous. We got another eight hours of driving, but before we get on the road, I figured we'd do a pod, um, and I figured I'd call my dad, phone a friend who wants to be a millionaire style. I'm calling dad, try to get a pod in. Sorry about the wait, but here it is. Howie Long joins us from Flathead Lake, Montana in his green shirt for green light. And I have my uh, cowboy hat on because it is a travel pod. Dad, how are we doing? We're good. We're good. I'm glad we could get this thing together. We've had a couple of false, false starts. Yeah, we really have, man. And and we, for the people at home, we were trying to get this out to you. So it'd come out Tuesday and we had internet problems. The tail end of the week last week, I had my anniversary uh, Saturday, so I couldn't work. Uh, and Sunday we hit Balcony Falls on the James River, in the James River Gorge. Dad, you saw some footage. Hmm. Do you think you, you'd join us on a trip like this? <laughs> Look, does the, does the name Humpty Dumpty tell you anything? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if I fall on, at the James River Falls or whatever the hell that is, mm -hmm. uh, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put me back together again. Yeah, I would worry. I would feel I, we, we left uh, some of the green light team at home because we were worried they wouldn't be able to make it through the trip. Specifically? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to name any names. But uh, Cowboy Reed did great. He shredded Balcony Falls. Cowboy, uh, Reed, Nate, Cowboy Reed is the most interesting man in the world. I swear he's he shocks me. I saw him jumping into the right in front of the falls off the off the rock. What was that about 15 foot drop? What off the uh, no, nah, he was no, nah, you saw a video of him jumping off the bridge. I feel like I don't know where I saw oh, him in front of the waterfall. It, yep, yep, yep. That's about a 10 foot fall. It's shocked, foot fall. Sure it shocked his folks. We went swimming in a, in a waterfall. I feel like the guy's dad sometimes, you know, like I feel like you or something trying to reel him in. He's always off doing his own thing, but we had a great trip. We stayed uh, in Tennessee another night and stayed at those two waterfalls it was awesome and then uh ended up at the beer olympics yesterday dad i was paired up with uh quentin nelson so the backstory is i uh get an invite to this beer olympics it's in vegas it's one of those things you commit to you don't think about for a while and then it's coming up and i'm like i don't want to go to vegas the thing gets switched to nashville so so far so good and then i find out they pair me up with dean blandino your coworker, and no offense to dean blandino but when you got Dennis Kelly, Graham Glasgow, Delaney Walker, a bunch of big beer drinking guys, Quentin Nelson as well, I wanted a partner that suited me better. So I, I, I caused a stink and I ended up with Quentin Nelson and, uh, and it was a lot of fun. That dude is all ball dad. Yeah. <clears throat> he's, a, he's a Jersey guy. He's from close to where mom's from. I know. We FaceTime mom and uh, they went to like damn near the same school. 
Uh, and I guess he has a brother that went to um, Villanova, so oh. six degrees of sep- separation there. But me and Q, about two events in, the first event we have to chug a beer, well, three beers out of a boot. So you three beers down right away. And then uh, it goes into flip cup and beer pong. And by about the second event, me and Quentin looked at each other and said, hey, I don't care if we win this or not. Let's just have a good time. Yeah. And that was the best thing that I could hear from Quentin because I didn't want to let him down. Uh, we ended up losing in beer pong a couple rounds in and then just kicked it by the pool the rest of the day. But it was a good time. Um, That's a great trip. It was a great trip. You used to take road trips. I saw. Yeah. Dude, so tell me what you guys did with the, the home video thing, because honestly, it's the best thing ever. <clears throat> well, we we just went through some old tapes, you know, VHS tapes that we had and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And we hadn't looked at in years and we didn't do a lot of filming because we were fighting for our lives with the three of you guys. Um, and uh, this was when we went to the Colorado River. I'd never driven a, an RV, so we rent an RV and we're with a guy named Blaine Kuhn and, you know, just a great guy. And um, we put a, a sea dew on the back trailer, uh, pulling that down. And Kyle's like, uh, he's under a year old and, and uh, you know, you're, you know, four or five years old, four years old. And, uh, you know, they're, they're selling us on this whole idea that it's going to be, it's paradise. It's on the river. You know, you, you, walk, you drive in, you plug in air conditioning. It's, it's fabulous. It's beautiful. We get there really late because the roads are narrow and it's treacherous and there's some rain. And, you know, it was just really a, and, and mom doesn't feel good for some reason. And we end up getting there. And as it turns out, the last plug had been taken. So it's 104 degrees or two degrees on the Colorado River. And mom is, unbeknownst to her, pregnant with Howie and doesn't feel good. And Kyle's there and he's he's under one. And uh, and it's you and me out in a tent outside the the camper, the uh, the the RV. And uh, then we go out on the dock and <clears throat> They've got shirts down there, or signs that say "Show me your boobs," and you know, gals are gals are pulling up their shirts, and you know, here you are. And I'm I'm not impressionable sure. age. I'm not sure if this is the right environment. Maybe maybe it was a precursor to the Tennessee trip. Yeah, maybe so. I mean, listen, what was fun to me about that whole thing was, and I think it's instructive, is the more videos you can hang on to, the better, because. Oh, we've had looking some- at that thing 30 years later. It's incredible. It's not only incredible to watch you in your adult form, like, you know, a little bit younger than me at that point. Yeah. And I'm kind of looking at like one of my peers, not my dad. Yep. You know, I'm looking at a guy my age doing what I'm doing. And um, it was rolling, fun, out of, rolling out of bed, jacked, you know, not having to work. Yeah, out. dude, you were you were you were a silverback gorilla looking guy. And uh, and you would obviously never being a city guy never rode a jet ski because you were out on that thing just doing all types of unsafe shit and now you're mr safety yeah. watching you try to spray people on the dock and try to do tricks in your tiny shorts 1989 yeah uh, it was hilarious man it was hilarious and what what it made me think about was all these videos i'm taking of my kids and me and my buddies looking back 20 30 years down the line like that's gold treasure you know to the point where I was on the river with John Phillips, who you know, John. Yeah. Played for the Cowboys for people at home, tight end, one of my best friends. And I'm taking videos the other day and I'm dating the videos. I'm, I'm like 19, or, you know, 2024, d- j- June 23rd. We're at the James River Gorge. Like I'm starting to shoot these videos like I would if I had a camcorder. You think about it, you guys are so, so far ahead from a technology standpoint. You know, th- there was nothing really then i mean cell phones were just being introduced and they were i think they came in like a briefcase and it was it was like it was like the the mobile phone that you see on tv that the president had in the 80s where he's you know the abort code is you know that kind of thing so we we really didn't we didn't have technology wasn't cameras were were cumbersome and they were hard to kind of deal with but we're in the project now of you know kind of 
getting all that stuff on on the uh, laptop and you know we keep sending more stuff as as we as we go you guys found a dvd of me and my buddies 18 years old going down to uh, new river gorge and whitewater rafting my yep. first summer out of high school i don't know how y'all let me do this but i appreciate it um we hopped in the car and drove a few hours and, and did the new river gorge and and uh the outfitters had a dvd of uh, us getting dumped into the river and 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 uh, hitting some of those big wave trains and just a dvd that's 20 years old is worth its weight in gold um so tons of great videos we'll be we'll be stacking them up trying to do just what you're doing man it's so funny we were talking about this when we tried the pod the first time but with father's day coming off father's day i told you you know i this is i'm 39 i got three kids watching that video kind of putting myself in your shoes a lot of the time it's pretty crazy full circle and so these father's days for me are like kind of special because i'm starting to realize what what it's about more you know like as you get older and you have more kids and and then i look at you and i say yeah man i really appreciate it um you know i was going to write you a note this father's day but i know you don't like nice things you know so I just figured I'd keep it short and sweet and tell you two weeks later on the podcast. But um, happy Father's Day. And, uh, and I did tell him in person and we spent the day. But, you know, I was listening uh, to uh, old man Neil Young. And I know it's not about somebody's dad, but, you know, we've always talked about when the song comes on. It's it's pretty it's pretty poignant. And uh, and so, yeah, full circle, man. Happy Father's Day. And uh, I'm watching those videos and i'm like man i'm a lot like you. <laughs> yeah you know i i it's interesting because in my mind's eye i'm you know watching you and you know i think you're listen you want your sons to be better than you are and i i think you know so far the the two boys who have kids are you know you're fully invested and you do so many great things with your kids and us watching you and watching Kyle, uh, both, you know, f you know, fully committed off the dock, you know, you know, having fun with the kids and, you know, you're building memories, you know, and, and us watching that is, that makes my father's day, uh, all the more special, uh, really, because you're such a great dad and Kyle's a great dad and, you know, love those grandkids to death. I mean, I just, golly, I, they make my, they make my day. I get a phone call from them and, uh, or they pop over the house to hop in the pool. Uh, it's, it's a treat. We're lucky. What age do you think I start button heads with my sons? What was the hardest age? Probably, I'm going to say 15 you know, 14, 15. Uh, I'm not sure why. Maybe it's just kind of like the cycle of life. And, you know, that's kind of when it when it starts to happen. <clears throat> You're trying to be a man and, you know, a young man and, um, you know, maybe making some choices that are, you know, we, we've we been down the highway. You're down the highway. You you know where the potholes are, you know, and, and you're, you've been behind the curtain and, you know, you realize that, you uh, there's some pitfalls out there. There's some bad people. And, you know, how do I best kind of educate and, you know, you know, mentor my sons and daughters to make sure. And, and you having a daughter is, is a whole nother, whole nother world, whole nother thing, you know, and I'm so I'm looking at it from the, the granddaughter perspective now where I only had boys. And I remember when you first got married with Maggie, it was like, how do I deal with the daughter-in-laws? You, you want to treat her like a daughter and how do I deal with it? How do I talk to her? How do I handle it? And she has been just a, a rock star. We love her to death. Would you do anything over that would help me? You know, the, the thing that I didn't realize was how difficult it was. And, and we had you and, you know, obviously Kyle and then Howie, we didn't realize, and I particularly didn't realize, how difficult it would be growing up as my son. Um, and you, you know, you had to go through some things, and I'm sure that that uh, 
that gave you kind of, you know, mixed kind of emotions and, and thoughts. And I think you kind of embraced it down the road, but there were times when you probably having me as a dad was somewhat of a pain in the ass <clears throat> to no fault of my own, but you know, people can be, can be mean. Well, I never blamed you. I was having this conversation yesterday with actually Burt Kreischer because he's a comedian. You know who he is, I think. Yeah. But he was at the pool and we were talking about, you know, he's got daughters who are older and, you know, when they go out and being able to be out in public and not be bothered. and um, You know, just the anecdotes that he was given reminded me of, you know, being the son of somebody who people think is their property. You know what I mean? Yep. You know, when you're out and about, um, you're trying to spend time with your kids, but it can be distracting. And then the athletic part of it is just, it's going to be more pressure. And so I just look at things that way with Waylon through that lens and, and Luke, I mean, you know, being my sons, they are going to be compared and trying to try not to put too much pressure on them to, yep. to have to be me, which you guys did a really good job of, you know, you never said, Hey, you've got to be me. Yeah. You, we, you, we, you, we, you are whoever you are and you do it to the best of your ability. We tried not to push you know, it hard at all. As a matter of fact, you were, you know, you'd rather be in a book when you were a kid uh, and, and, you know, doing projects and things like that. And, you know, it's kind of, you would, I say, exploded at 13. Uh, that was kind of the age where you just kind of said, you know what, I'm done screwing around. I'm, you know, I dropped my, you know, what's and, you know, I'm, I'm ready to roll and you were ready to roll. And, from that point on, it was you had a singular focus of what you wanted to do and, you know, your your size and weight. And, you know, you're not sure where that's going to go. Is it going to be, you know, you talk about offensive guard. I, I was thinking blocking tight end, actually. Um, but kind of like a JP, you know, if you were 250, you, you could you could play. But the game was so much different than if you remember. Uh, yeah, it's changed a lot. So. You know, pass rushers like people, you know, and we didn't know where you were going to be. But you said, I want to play Virginia. I want to run out the tunnel. I, you know, this is what I want to do. And uh, you are you were the easiest guy I've ever been around to coach, particularly off the field where we'd be up here in Montana and we had a sled. I don't know if you remember the sled we had in the garage and. Uh, you could put all the 45 pound plates on it. You wanted to. And I would just, just from a conditioning standpoint, simulate a, a, a 10 plate drive. And then you'd have a, a, a two minute rest, but the 10 plate drive was in succession. You would reset and go again and go again and go again. And you never, ever said, you know, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to do this. I'm, I, I'm tired. Uh, you, you always wanted to be in the best possible shape you could be. You wanted to be accountable. You wanted to be a good teammate. And, and that showed up down the road and uh, you made yourself. And I, I tell people that I said, look, <laughs> he, I, it was an auto drive. It was like one of those uh, cars where you just get in the electric cars and they just drive themselves. That was you. Uh, I never had to ask if you worked out. I've never had to ask if you did your job. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I always get this when people talk about genetics and, you know, hey, you were very talented, Chris. You know, that's why you got there and that sort of thing your dad played. And I would say, hey, I wasn't the most talented guy in most of the rooms I was in. Uh, Where was I? Even close. And and I, I think that's kind of the misnomer when it comes to the genetic thing, because, number one, you had – now, you could play today because you're athletic enough to do that and you were good enough to do that and you do it at a high level. Um, it's hard to compare errors. But I would say, like, you know, these are 80s genetics, you know, like it's not like I'm Julius Pepper's son. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, you know, so there was always that, hey, even if you earned it, you were handed something, which I think we were all handed something walking in the NFL. You have to be a God gifted athlete to come into the NFL and play. Every, every Yeah, every everybody, everybody's there for a reason physically. Um you know, I always say this, and I say this about Tom Brady. I say this about, you know, Peyton Manning, particularly a quarterback. It's here and it's here. It's, you know, what do you have here? What do you have here? How mentally tough are you? How 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 smart are you? And how, how, how willing are you to do the, you know, just those extra things that uh, separate you from good to very good, very good to great, and, and so on? Yeah. 
That's it. Um, we trained a lot in Montana. I, mean, I, I actually can remember when you, when I was a kid watching you in Montana hit a sled a little bit in the front yeah. yard by the, uh, by the lake. And, of course, I was never thinking in terms of, like, what's it going to be like when I do that? Or what time in the, the year is it? Because you never – you never really got us caught up in your schedule. You know what I mean? Like we, we were on vacation, um, but yep. you were working. What yep. would you do this time of year when you had the downtime before camp? Things were a lot different a couple CBAs ago. Camp was different, but talk me through the off season for a guy in the nineties and the eighties when you get that downtime. I wasn't much of a lifter, never was. Um, Running was important. Uh, sled was important. Uh, you know, I, a million club reps simulated in the first two steps on a sled, you know, three steps on a sled. Um, you know, right lead, right club, left rip, left lead, left club, right rip. Uh, you know, jab left, club right, left rip, or, you know, pass over. And I wasn't a big pass over guy. <clears throat> but just to run and, you know, here we are up in Montana where the lawn is, it's a country lawn. So, you know, you've got to figure out where the potholes are. Cause if I'm running gassers, gassers were a big thing for me. Uh, uh, hundreds were a big thing for me. And I remember I take, I took you to the same fields to run that I ran at. We ran down in Polson. Polson high school. Uh, we ran up at big fork high school, which maybe had the most spectacular, the football field had the most spectacular view, but once again, all those fields had, you know, little potholes. So I would meticulously walk out the 50 yards or 60 yards you were going to run or the hundred yards you were going to run and find the potholes and find the, the path of resistance. And running was, you know, and I always said, you know, you, the one thing you control is run, 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 run. And, you know, you were more of a lifter and, and that was easy to kind of adapt into, uh, but we didn't lift much. We played a lot of basketball. I played a ton of basketball. That's all I really did in the offseason. We didn't have OTAs. We didn't have mini camps. You know, there was none of that. As a general rule, particularly in the early 80s, you know, everyone got in shape in training camp, and it was a six-week training camp. It was two days every day, full gear, live inside run, live goal line, live pass rush, all that. So it was it – was, we start the in individual period with 42 up downs and, you know, every day in training camp and just go. That was at Greg, Greg Williams reinstated that deal with the up downs. And I can remember being in the garage in Montana every day and doing 40 up downs because yep. he would warn us that he was going to start practices with 40 up downs. And of course the first day, probably on like your setup, Greg would have us do about 30. And if guys weren't falling out, then he'd say <clears> you're done. And then we wouldn't do it anymore. Um, but I, I remember getting ready for that deal. And I know you going into camp with six weeks ahead of you. I wonder if you had that dark cloud over you kind of the way I did in oh. July, because I never felt like I was on vacation, even though I was, I never felt I was on vacation really. And I, and I never felt comfortable in my, well, you know, I mean, it was a different time. It was a different era. You know, you made less, a lot less money. And none of it was guaranteed through 13 years. So, you know, here I am with, you know, at one point three kids and, you know, I've, I've got to, I've got to make sure I'm good. I've got to make sure I'm ready to go. I've got to earn my money and I've got to make the team. And, you know, I, I was a guy that always kind of felt like I had to prove it every day, every year, every month. And uh, I think that's the torture of, I said this to, to Max Crosby the other day. I said the first time I really kind of look back on my career with any kind of comfort of perspective were the last three or four steps I took to the podium at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, up till then, it was like, you know, yesterday's over. The only thing I control is today, and I've got to win today. I've got to, I've got to be great on Wednesday. I've got to be great on Thursday. I've got to be great on Friday. I've got to be great on Saturday. <laughs> and, you know, that that lived with you in the off season. So, like I said, you know, I've apologized to you because when I was playing, it was, 
you know, because of the non-guarantees, because of, you know, the injuries and you play with, you played with things a little bit more then um, than you do now, um, you know, it was a, it was a really difficult kind of a, every day was, <clears throat> it presented its own new challenge. And I had to deliver for you guys. And that was the most important thing to me. One thing that's changed a lot is, the coverage of our league cool. and um you know nothing happens without us hearing about it one of the things that you know slow slow news week last week one of the things that slid across the desk was justin fields and cj stroud vacationing in morocco okay <laughs> so it's 1989 <laughs> i want to read you a headline john elway and joe theisman are in the south of france vacationing what do you think has that ever happened back in the day? Did people hang out on different teams? You know, they, not that I, uh, listen, not that I know of, you know, playing for the Raiders, we were an island onto ourselves. So, you know, I mean, it, it was us against everybody. And, you know, the when you think about it, the internet, cell phones, all that stuff, uh, TikTok, you know, X, all, all those pretty good, that, dad, pretty good. All that stuff that people communicate with. Now you guys text guys in the off season, get together guys, talk to other guys from other teams. The first conversation I had with John Elway was the night before I retired at the Super Bowl. We, we were at a closed restaurant and we were drinking till about one thirty two in the morning. And That's late for you. Oh, totally. And uh, totally out of character. I mean, I, and John and I spoke, and in those days, it wasn't my job to be friends with the people I was playing against. Now, you went to the Pro Bowl, and, you, you know, that kind of went away a little bit. Uh, but, you know, you certainly were, you know, were aware of it, particularly with people that you played against in division in particular. <laughs> you were a little friendlier to people outside of division, but in division, you certainly didn't do that. That's changed. I mean, guys would – Listen, you had the beat writer, and that was it. And maybe you had UP, UPI and AP, the, the news forum that would, you know, the all the stories from the West Coast would hit the East Coast on on AP or whatever. Uh, a guy could disappear for two days in the middle of the week. Let's, you know, let's name one of your teammates on your defensive front. Robert Quinn could disappear for two days, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday, and nobody would know. Right. Because, Except for the people in the building who are like, where's Robert Quinn? Yeah, and there's no media in our, our our kind of facility, just the required stuff, and the required stuff was very little then. And the beat writer was kind of the guy that wrote on the plane – and he was more of the classic kind of movie beat writer that you'd imagine. And uh, it might look the other way. And, you know, um, he was loyal to the team to a certain extent. You know, he had to be critical at times, but wasn't going to expose that. So we had guys that, you know, without naming any names, but we had some guys disappeared for a couple of days. Yeah, well, I mean, it's funny because we get into the whole conversation about generations. And we've had this conversation, I think, on uh various occasions where there's this there's this general idea that people in today's game are softer because they like to hang out with each other because it's not as much of a business thing or a sports thing it's like hey everybody's on a personal basis with each other and i would contend that had the guys in the 80s had the connectivity that we have now would have been the same thing I say that because, you know, I watched The Last Dance. I watched, heard stories about Danny Ainge playing golf with Jordan in the middle of the playoffs and those guys. Yeah. I know that in a special circumstance when me and Joe Green, who went to college with Cedric Hartman, who's your roommate, comes into town for a game, you're like, of course we're going to have fucking me and Joe Green over for dinner well, for the game. Well, see, that, that part of it, okay. That's, that's a little that's, different. That's a good point, but that's a different kind of thing where if it's a defensive lineman – Mm -hmm. I'm not having an offensive guard. No, and I don't think that's ever happened. Like even when yeah, Kyle, but when so Kyle would play, we'd say I, what's up, but I, he wasn't going to come over the house. 
I lived with Cedric Harbin, and for people who don't know Cedric Harbin, over 100 sacks, San Francisco 49ers, came to the Raiders late, won, won a title in 80-81 with the Raiders uh, Super Bowl. They were a wild card team, first wild card team to win the Super Bowl down in New Orleans. And could you imagine what that week was like down there with a Raider team in New Orleans <clears throat> with no, you know, no kind of media that they have now? Um, Joe Green was his roommate, teammate at uh, North Texas State. And uh, he came over and, you know, Joe Green was my, you know, when you're at Villanova, you get a lot of Pittsburgh news and you see a lot of Pittsburgh games. And, uh, you know, to have dinner with him was really a, an amazing thing as a rookie uh, coming out of Villanova where you're playing Delaware one week and now you're sitting down with Joe Green at dinner at your little place in Alameda out in Oakland. Yeah. I mean, that was a, one of my favorite stories. And, yeah, I, I do think it was just a little different. You know, like it's hard to compare the eras, just like it's hard from a football stance. Well, here's, the, I think th here's the thing that I believe. I think this group today, you, you, you really the group today is indicative of the mass media, 24-hour news cycle. You make a mistake right now, <clears throat> it's in China 30, 30 seconds later. You know, it, Everything, it, it, the world is so connected. That's so, why in, in some ways I think guys are tougher now and in some ways they're not. I think they can compartmentalize, you know, business and personal. They can be social with, with you know, players that they play against. And then when it comes time to buckle it up, listen, this league is bigger, stronger, faster than – our, my generation and, you know, generations 10, 12 years ago. <clears throat> and anyone who tells you otherwise is, you know, it's that Clint Eastwood, Grant Torino thing, get off my lawn. You know, it's the old yeah, guy. Exactly. The porch that exactly. Young lawn. And then it's the truth because you think about it and put this into perspective. Terry Bradshaw's offensive line, the Steelers who won four Super Bowls, 252. Yeah. That's what they weigh as, on an average. Okay. Yeah. Joe Green was 280, 275, 280. That position now weighs, what, 320? 320, 320. Look at your guys in Philadelphia. How yeah. big are they? Um, so everything changes. And, and it's gone from a league where in the 80s you had maybe seven or eight guys that could run 4-3, four, 4-4. Four, four. And every team has seven or eight guys that can run 4-3. 4-4. Four, yeah, four four range. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's true. You know, I mean it's, it's different. It's true. Now, one thing uh that's different is the fashion sense. Uh you probably didn't see this, but Joe Burrow went to the fashion week over in Europe. Uh not that I know which country that's in. Um, and he had like a black suit with an open back. And uh needless to say, it's something I wouldn't wear, but Joe oh. Burrow is is a cool motherfucker. Uh, you know, yeah. he's Joe cool. And so yeah. if he wants to wear that, that's cool with me. I wonder in your era who the coolest guy was, who did you think was the coolest damn guy in the eighties? I got a couple ideas in my head. I think John Riggins was so cool. If, it, if, if I could have gone back and been John Riggins living by, you know, river in an RV and kind of being his own kind of character, it seemed. I think John Riggins was really cool. I'm on a Larry Zonka kick. I told you after I saw that. I'm all about the fullbacks, man. I saw Larry Zonka ranting about the uh, the 72 Dolphins team. And I like that guy, man. I think there were some cool guys in the 80s. I think players were cooler in the 80s. Who was the coolest guy that you played against or with? Uh, I think you're probably being a little nostalgic. But, you know, I, I think um, Burrow – Reminds me kind of a little bit of Joe Namath. He's got a little Joe Namath in him. You know, I mean, a little more kind of polished. Joe Joe played at Alabama and, you know, under Bear Bryant, I believe, <clears throat> and uh, went to the Jets. And that's, you know, you go to the Jets and that's the biggest market at that time. And and anything that he did, and of course, he he makes the he makes the proclamation that we're going we're gonna to win. And it's one of the biggest upsets in, in, I don't know if it was the biggest upset in NFL history because people felt like they had a real shot in the game, but ends up winning the Super Bowl and he called the shot for the Jets and you know it, it hasn't happened since. 
<laughs> um, cool guys. Golly, I don't know. You know, I mean, there, there wasn't a lot of media. Uh, John Elway was kind of cool. He was a guy who bucked, you know, the thing. The closest I've come to superstar, you know, crazy, crazy kind of popular, Bo Jackson was like playing with Elvis. Um, you know, we had to go in the back of the building. You know, you, you had to have special security for him. Uh, in today's game, he would be the equivalent of Taylor Swift and, and Travis. You know, we're that big. He would be that big and that popular. Imagine a guy that could do what, what he did in today's world and, you know, roll out of bed looking the way he did and, you know, just an amazing character. Uh, great name, Bo Jackson. Just, mm -hmm. Yeah. I um you're talking about the the Taylor Swift thing. I was wondering when you played, did any of your teammates or friends in the league have a girlfriend or si significant other that was so popular that it became a thing? No, because the media didn't cover it. It just wasn't covered. So I don't know if any players dated, you know, Lyle kind of Dabbled a little bit and, you know, you know, early. Lyle, of all people, had celebrity girlfriends. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, Lyle was, <laughs> Lyle was, was married and, you know, we, we were friends with his wife and, and his, his baby. And, um, but, you know, after the fact, you know, I mean, Lyle dabbled in Hollywood. Lyle made some movies. Lyle sparred with Muhammad Ali up in Denver, I think, uh, which turned into a fight. Um, he did some wild stuff. Lyle was, Lyle was a guy who wanted to kind of, he would have been great in today's environment. You know, he would be so popular. You stick him into a, a, you know, WWE wrestling format. He's a showman. He's a showman. He really was. But also a damn animal, like a gorilla. And Card I know he, Card he, beat up, Batman. he beat up the fucking barbarian brothers. You know, and they were, you know, and I'd worked out with him down at Gold's Gym, and Gold's Gym was amazing in Venice. Yeah, who was in Gold's Gym? Everybody. You know, all the bodybuilders, all the, some of the, a lot of celebrities, people that you've seen in movies, you know. <clears throat> but <clears throat> these two guys were identical twins, and they were called the Barbarians. And, you know, I got along with them fine. They were, they were quirky and a little bit different, and you know, uh, lived in, probably wore the same outfit, working out five days a week, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, and they were big and, you know, could lift a lot of weight. But for whatever reason, they pissed Lyle off. And, you know, I guess, you know, as allegedly, uh, he had a 10-pound plate and was chasing them around the gym, trying to beat them with the 10-pound plate. <clears throat> you know, Lyle. Why a 10-pound plate? Grab the 20. Grab a 45, Lyle. Well, I think he was looking for speed and and deliver delivery kind of impact, and I think he felt like the ten was sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, he had to catch him. He was uh, I called him Three Mile Isle because he was after Three Mile Island, which exploded at some point. You know, during when I was playing, and he was he was like that. He was like a. New Did you and Lyle ever get into it? No, you know, I think we came close once, and I think it was kind of like Russia and USA, where we you've got both got your fingers on the button, and he'd seen me. He knew he knew who I was. We roomed together in 1982 at the Oakland Airport Hilton when the team moved to L.A. but practiced in Oakland. So we uh, we every game was a road game. And here I am living with Lyle. Marcus was right across the hallway. <clears throat> if you ever have Marcus on, he'll tell the whole story. And he'll tell some Lyle stories that would be crazy. But Lyle would get a piece of chocolate cake every single night at like 9.30, 9.45 and a glass of milk. He'd eat the cake. He'd drink the milk. He'd shut the TV off and shut the lights off. Not, hey, are you watching that? I'm 21, 22 years old. You know, and I'm a young guy and 
Marcus is across the hall with uh, a linebacker, uh, and I'd get a roll away cot and go over there and sleep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lyle was, uh, you know, we, we had a, a, a moment where, you know, in my mind it was either going to happen or it wasn't going to happen. And, you know, I, for whatever reason it, it didn't happen and cooler heads prevail. But I think Lyle had seen me enough at work uh, to know, you know, this could potentially not, you know, not it could go. be ugly for both parties. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the Raiders. What, like, what's your excitement level right now? I, I, you know, as an alum, you always seem to, I don't know if it's just the losing or you seem to keep, yeah, it wears on you, you know, okay. And I wonder, other than the Super Bowl run with Gruden, when they lost the Bucks and everything, is this a time period where you're most excited about the Raiders because of Max, because of AP, because of some of the, you know, the, they, they seem like a throwback team under Antonio. And I wonder if, if you get excited getting ready to watch them this season. I, I told Antonio when we, I came up there for the Super Bowl. I, you know, I hugged him. I said, I'm so freaking excited. I'm jumping out of my skin. You know, I wish I was, 28 and you know could go back and you know press the press the go back button and and be a part of this because it's it's a renaissance of in my mind and, and there's a couple of reasons why <clears throat> one is i think they made a mistake a few years ago and you know they had the special teams coach take over as head coach uh and i i think he captured the the heart of the locker room and had created kind of a, a culture. And, you know, when that guy gets up in front of the room on Monday, people either believe it or not. You know that. I mean, any room you've been in, that guy has to be authentic. And Antonio is a guy that grew up right around the Coliseum. And, you know, knew the Raiders, was a fan of the Raiders growing up. He understood the history. And I, and I said this to Max the other day when I spoke to Max. I said, history is great, and it's great to, you know, appreciate that and respect that and, and honor that. But it's time to make for this team and this group to make their own history. And I said to Max, I said, the thing that's so impressive about what he's done there is when I got in that building, you know, Al Davis, Ron Wolf, Tom Flores, all Hall of Fame, Jim Plunkett, Art Shell, Gene Upshaw, you know, uh, Freddie Belitnikoff is around all the time. Jim Otto's around all the time. <clears throat> you know, uh, Cliff Branch, Ted Hendricks, Lester Hayes, Mike Haynes. It goes on and on and on. They'd won a Super Bowl two years earlier than that. So the culture and identity of who the team was was already established. This team's been kind of, you know, a, a, a wandering ship, both both from a location standpoint going from – Oakland to LA, then back to Oakland and then to Vegas. And, and I, and I think now with the facility in Vegas and the stadium in, in, in Vegas, that I think is awesome. Both facilities are amazing. <clears throat> it was difficult for Max to go in there in a place that had lost its identity and lost its culture and create that. And I think that's uh, an impressive thing for both Antonio and I'm, I'm excited about the defense. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, O'Connell is, is a guy that, you know, sh showed some flashes, and I think they're going to give him every opportunity to be the guy. But, uh, you know, I, th I think uh, Minshew is, is a gamer. He's not a guy that I think impresses you on Wednesday and Thursday. But for whatever reason, whether it's Jacksonville or, or when he was stopped in Philly and with the Colts, and I think his last two stops – both in Philly and the Colts, I think he gained a great deal from both of those stops. You know, if, if personally, I think, you know, scheme, system, coaching, all that. And I, I think he, if he gets the opportunity, he might not relinquish it. How hard is it in that division? I mean, I know you got a better way to ask this question is, I guess it, with the Chiefs trying to three-peat, they're still the Chiefs, but with all the distractions, because – you can't control people when they go off to wherever they go off to in the off season. And some guys have had issues and I can't help but think, you know, part of it is the whirlwind that, that goes into repeating being champion even once 
you know, the way that offseason unfolds, do you think that the Chiefs have anything to worry about with some of the stuff you see popping up? Or do they just always find a way, in your opinion? I think it starts at the top. Um, I think with Andy and, you know, their GM. Andy has a big heart. Andy thinks, you know, I think Andy thinks he can save a lot of people. And, you know, you take a chance on a, a guy or two and some work out and some don't. And uh, one thing about the Chiefs and, and Andy, I think, and, and the GM is they've, they've shown the ability to move on, uh, you know, and they, and they do move on. And, and they've shown that they have a philosophy. Listen, when you start out with the quarterback, you know, and, and a guy like Kelsey who big game, you know, whatever, whatever the situation is, it's never too big. It's, I agree with you on one thing. I think it's challenging to repeat getting everyone refocused on the same page, being hungry. They've had parades, they've had parties, they've had awards. Everyone's patting you on the back and everyone in your division particularly is you know, has prepared more for you because your number one goal as a GM and a, and, and a team is winning the division <clears throat> and you're building to win in the division and our ball going, you know, to the chargers and, you know, and, and now, you know, Denver and the changes they've made, you know, it's, and, and the Raiders are getting better. Uh, and, you know, they beat Kansas city last year and, and they beat them convincingly. You know, yeah, so, that was an ugly game. So they're they're in their, <clears throat> I think they're in their head a bit, um, and that defense has gotten better. Uh, but I will say this: what's unique about three is no one's ever done it. And I think when you add that to the equation for guys that are aware of, you know, this is historic stuff. And if anything can focus you in even more than just a repeat, it's let's do three. Now you've got to be healthy. You, you've got to stay. You've got to stay smart, and you know, get home at night and do the right thing, and you know, not get in trouble, and uh, work hard. And last year we saw them out of the gate, and they looked, you know, lost. Uh, drop balls. The offense was erratic kind of all over the place. The defense was actually carrying them. And then they kind of figured it out. And I can't, I can't really emphasize how great Andy Reid is as a coach. And, you know, your, your guy on defense, uh, you know, Spags has proved to be the, one of the greatest big game defensive coordinators in NFL history. I worry about LeJarrius Sneed going. I worry about Willie Gay going. I mean, and I'm a guy that put the Chiefs in the Super Bowl last year, even when people weren't putting them in the Super Bowl. So, yep. you know, I'm I'm all about the Chiefs, and I'm impressed any time a team can do something like this or even be within, within striking distance of repeating or repeating three times in a row, which would be historic. I do worry about some of the distractions. I think the division is going to be tougher. I think if you look at – Harbaugh, the way he coached the Niners in a strike shortened season uh, or CBA lockout shortened season, uh, coming in there, team that was kind of middling, you know, immediately has them double digit wins. Turns out Smith into somebody who's fun to watch, right? Efficient, had one of his best years there, including his time in Kansas City. Uh, and then to be able to roll with Cap, we knocked Smith out of the game in San Francisco and Cap comes in and, and, and just goes nuts. I think the Chargers will be better than people think immediately. Um, so I, I do think, you know, you've got two really proven coaches in division outside of Andy now and one guy who seems to have a secret sauce in Vegas to get those guys to play hard. And, and I think adding Jack Jones, the kid who got cast away from New England, at corner, actually had a pick six, I believe, against Kansas City in that game we were talking about. And, giving and, and Antonio's ability to to reach a player like that. Yes, exactly, and very uniquely because yeah. Jack Jones was at Arizona State when he was coaching yeah. at Arizona State under Herm Edwards. So, you know, I, I just feel like. Every team in the division is taking a step forward. Now, one team's trying to do the unthinkable. And I wonder if they do the unthinkable and they do a three-peat, 
can you put Patrick Mahomes in the echelon of Tom Brady? I mean, I already put – if you give me prime Patrick Mahomes and prime Patrick, and prime Tom Brady, I don't think you ha- there's a wrong answer there. Now, if you do the resume thing and you say, hey, Brady's got X amount of rings and these accolades and that sort of thing, well, that's what Kansas City is trying to do right now. But the one thing the Patriots never did was three-peat. And I feel like it's even harder to do it now than it was when they had opportunities to do it. And I think what's interesting about the Patriots run, and I've said this before, is and impressive. They went a decade between, you know, Super Bowls, if it's not for that Malcolm Butler interception. If you you look at and you go back and do this because you enjoy doing stuff like this. Go back and look at the number of offensive linemen, the number of wide receivers, the number of running backs that Tom Brady over the course of that run played with. Yep. It's pretty staggering. It's okay. Really staggering. And 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 the different types of they were they were a different team with Moss and you know and that whole group and then they buckle it up and it's we're going to run it 40 times and we're going to do it this way and then we're going to do it this way and you know <clears throat> that will never ever be duplicated again and I, you know of- I I I got to push back cuz I feel like it could be duplicated if Andy coaches a long time and Patrick stays healthy I think the transition from Tyreek to no Tyreek is huge. Even if you have Travis Kelsey, I think the the people that they've been able to win with outside the last two years, some of the 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 pieces they've reshuffled, they reshuffled their their offensive line. I mean, that was a dumpster fire at times last year, and they found a way to win. So while I agree with you that it would be almost impossible to duplicate it, there is one team that could. Here's the key. And, Here's and, the key. and this is the team. I agree with you. Here's the key. And here's the question. Tom Brady had such a singular focus for 20 plus years. Chris, as you know, you know, I mean, it, there's distractions, there's family, there's, you know, life and, and all those things that, that pull at you and justifiably so. But can Patrick sustain the focus and, you know, I, I pray that Andy can coach forever. Yeah, me you too. Know, I, I really do. I love Andy. You know, he's he's one of my favorite people. We covered him in Philadelphia. We, you know, we've, we, we've covered him a little bit less in Kansas City because he's in the AFC and we don't get them on the air a lot. <clears throat> but when he was in Philadelphia, a lot. And um, big, big fan of Andy's. And, you know, from when he was back in Green Bay and Ron Wolf was up there and, um, but can Patrick, can that duo of, of Andy and Pat stay together, stay healthy, stay focused? And, and if they can, then, you know, the sky's the limit. Yeah, because I think if they win five and they three-peat, well, we're putting a lot of carts before the horses here, but let's say they three-peat. That, to me, puts them in, you know, not to me, it, it, period, puts them in rare air. There's no there's no other football team that's been able to do it. And this is in the age of free agency and and player movement and that sort of thing. And on top of it, if they were able to add a couple more over the next decade and get to five or so. To me, it's not seven rings against five rings or six rings against five rings or, you know, it, it you take things individually and you compare them. And I think this run would be just as impressive if they were able to, to you know, one for the thumb type thing at the end of a 10-year run um, from here on out. And, you know, a lot has to go right for them, just like with other teams. If Dre Greenlaw doesn't get hurt, I don't know if they win that game, you know. But you can point to various outcomes throughout the, the Patriots' uh, dynasty where you're like, yeah, that was the flip of a coin. Or something yep. went their way, and that's what it takes to win. What was, the, what, what was the average number of points that you know the Patriots won their Super Bowls by? I think it was three or. Four. And 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 Bill would tell you, it's indicative of how how tight the margins are in the NFL. Yeah, and that's the one thing about a football team is, it's not like basketball where you might look at the end of a Lakers run. Um, in the early 2000s and say there was a series like the the Philly series, you know, where it's five games. There's no games like that for the Patriots. Right. You know, whether it was 
beating Carolina, whether it was beating Seattle, whether it was being down 28 to three, that's what makes that stuff so impressive. I wouldn't say you could take any one of those teams and say, hey, that's the best team ever. No team was more comfortable playing under duress at the end of the game than the Patriots. Because as you you know, having been there, everything that's going to happen is rehearsed. And it's predictable, the things that that a game is going to hinge on, whether it's end of half, two-minute situational football, um, you know, certain metrics that, a, you know, a bill might be after they just had a mastery of those margins, you know, and, and I think the mastery of those margins add up to championships. Who's comfortable in that situation. Patrick is comfortable. Yes, he, he is comfortable They're the, you know, and they're going to find their guys that are going to be, you know, the, the young receiver came on at the end of the season and, and really started to show. And he had, He's had some, I think they've had some issues there too, but uh, somebody will step up, whether it's they'll go more too tight end early on or whatever. They'll, they'll figure it out by the end of the year and be there at least to have a shot. And I think that's what great quarterbacks do. You talk about Buffalo and, hey, a lot of concerns about who's outside there. Love him. But, yeah, but I love Josh Allen, and I think with Curtis Samuel having spent time with Joe Brady – um, investing in this this kid from Florida State who could end up being pretty good and having those two tight ends and saying, hey, like we have Brandon Bean on. And I say, what do you say to people that are thinking you guys are going to take a step back because you had to let Stephon Diggs go? Well, tight end, the tight ends are who the offense runs through. Yeah. And so if we, we don't look at a Kincaid as a real weapon, sure, but that's not the way the game's played. You don't take the tight ends out of the equation. And I also think there is the unspoken, um, you know, kind of, glossed over increase in production you're going to get out of guys by having a guy like Josh or Patrick in the backfield. And and the unknown commodity that is a draft pick or a a Curtis Samuel, who's a veteran guy who's played good football, but has never been in a situation like this. So, yeah, whether it's Kansas City or Buffalo, as long as you have a guy like that under center, you can be back in those games year after year. Here's the key with the young receivers in Buffalo which make it different than just about every place you play, maybe with the exception of Baltimore. Scramble drill. Well, it's a scramble drill, but it's also, you know, run blocking. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're running routes. you got to run the route hard, even though it's a run, and you've got to transition to a, a run blocker because the quarterback is such a big part of that offense. Yeah, no question. Uh, and no question. and this young young wide receiver who's used to just running routes and, you know, maybe doing the obligatory kind of run block and occasionally if he gets angry, uh, you know, pin somebody. But uh, he's got to change the way he looks at the offense. Yeah. Um, we were talking about a team you might not see a lot because they're in the AFC. How about a team that you see a lot and you're forced to talk about a lot is the Dallas Cowboys. Um, I don't know about the Cowboys this year. And I'm not being vindictive. I'm not anti-Cowboys. I only played in Philly two years. You you know me. I don't hate the Cowboys. Yeah. It's more of just something that I have to consume year in and year out as a media member now. And I'm picking up on the patterns and uh, to me they're going to talk about the Cowboys a lot Dak doesn't have his contract you know I don't know who's playing running back for them the who's offensive playing line playing is thinner linebacker. than it's been who's, huh? playing linebacker. who's playing linebacker for them we, we start with the offense the receiving core is really thin if CD pulls up with a hamstring I just hey year in and year out the story with the Cowboys is they are good enough on paper to win it the yep. question is, can they put it together? And this year, I don't think they're good enough on paper. And I, you know, I think, I think, you know, timing is everything for particularly a quarterback for contracts. And, you know, they're, they're in the middle of, you know, a kind of a, a stalemate there in Dallas right now. Um, and, and Dak is going to be a unrestricted free agent at the end of the season. So if Dak plays the way he did last year during the season, and, you know, for whatever reason, they're out of the playoffs. You know, I, I think it's easy for people to say, well, that's Dallas and that's that's a different situation. We'll take Dak Prescott and we'll reset the market. <clears throat> I think Jerry is probably one of those because they've got to get they've got to get a wide receiver signed. They've got to get an outside linebacker signed. 
They've got to get the quarterback signed. And, you know, and we've talked about this and I don't under, I, you know, I don't fully understand the quarterback separate, you know, cap situation, but I, I'm, I'm sure of one thing, the people that are, you know, in the back rooms whispering about this potential new, you know, quarterback cap thing are teams that are about to have to pay quarterbacks, not teams that have already paid quarterbacks. And right at the top of that list would be Jerry. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think if it has a shot, when Jerry backs it, it has a shot. I don't understand the specifics of it. You know, we talked about it. You know, where here's, is- here, here's what I would propose, because I don't know where they're going to go. But what I would propose, the cap's 255 right now or so, right? I would propose that that cap stays the same and that becomes a pool with one less big swimmer, right? That's the key. That's the key. If that cap stays the same, and let's say that quarterback cap is separate, does not affect the player pool, and can escalate year in and year out based on the market, and yeah, it could get gaudy and it could get astronomical. But you can't but feel the, the team. You, you struggle to field a team right now. You're struggling to field a team, and I think it's bad for the NFL that certain teams can't get in the dance. Right. And and I think it's good for the NFL, conversely, if teams can stay in the dance, because I think it's good for the NFL to keep groups together. I use the example of the LOB. You know, that's got to break up when you pay Russell Wilson. They had the cheat code in the in the uh, in, in drafting a quarterback and having him on a rookie deal and having all those talented pieces around him. But then when it comes to pay, time to pay the piper, you can't pay everybody. And I don't think teams should be punished for drafting well. I think, in fact, teams should be encouraged uh, for drafting well. And, and, and I also think fans enjoy, and I don't want to speak for the fans who are listening to this, but I think they enjoy owning the same jersey for a decade. I think they enjoy rooting for the same players. I think it's good for football to have those teams that are together. And I think this would enable teams like that to do that. The one wrinkle I threw in, if you added a separate quarterback cap, is you have to do something to offset not having that advantage anymore if you have drafted well and you have a rookie on a quarterback, uh, rookie quarterback deal, you know, that still needs to be an advantage. Um, so I, I don't know how you do that. Uh, I also think some, somebody like CJ Stroud should be making a lot of money right now, you know? Yeah. But, you know, I, I think CJ Stroud is an outlier. Um, right. You know, to a great extent. But I think start, it makes sense to me that you can start it after year four. Let's say C.J. Stroud or whoever the quarterback is, the first-round pick. Right now, as it stands, you could be a first-round pick. You've got a four-year contract with a fifth-year option. They could pick the option up, then they can franchise tag you not once but twice, but the number is punitive towards your your overall salary cap. And that that's what, in, in, in the spirit of the kind of rule, it, that's what they had in mind when they – they put that number on the second salary cap in particular. I'm talking about franchise tag. Uh, the franchise tag runs the number up to an astronaut. We should do away with that anyways. I agree. I, I You know what? you got a four-year deal with a 50-year option. That's it. That, that should be it. Out. That should yeah. be it. And then, and then that separate cap charge. I remember years ago, it was the first it started with the Larry Bird exemption in the NBA, and then it went to the max deal, and then it went to the super max deal. So they kind of work their way around it, but that's easier to do with a 15-man roster. What you if gotta- they subsid- What if they subsidized it like stadiums? You know how they're like, hey, here at Buffalo, you owe us $800 million. Here at Buffalo, you owe us $200 million if you want to keep Josh. <laughs> you know, if the cities had to pay for their quarterbacks, be kind of a wild party. Right? I know Buffalo is doing a new stadium, right? Yeah, I guess they are. And supposedly yeah, it's, it's going to be grass. And it is going to be outdoor, but they're going to have some covered spaces for the fans. Anyways, that's a whole other deal. Um, all right. So, Fox, obviously, you like it when NFC teams are doing well. You probably like covering certain teams more than other. I don't know if I could ask you that. But, like, who is a team that if you wave a magic wand that would be good for Fox and the NFL and make them better, who would you wave that magic wand on? Well, I think the wand started to kind of – wave over Chicago, you know, I, and I, and that's a team that would be big for us. And, you know, I, I think Detroit was a, 
I love Detroit's run. I, I loved everything about Detroit. I love the coach, love the GM, uh, love the personnel. I like the the quarterback story and the arc of his of his career. You know, starting with your group and you know when the offense was so bad, and then you know up McVay coming in and he changes the offense. It's run oriented. He goes up. I'd like to see that, you know, if they could follow the jet stream from Chicago and take it right to the Giants and and make the Giants relevant again. Uh, you know, because right now the Giants aren't relevant. And they've been sneaky irrelevant for a while now. And, and yep. when I look at this roster, again, it's kind of like the Dallas thing in a different way. I don't know if they're really taking a stab at it. It doesn't feel like one of those teams is taking a stab at it. And I think part of it might be the Daniel Jones thing. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think it'd be good for football if the Giants were better. And it'd certainly be good for Fox. Let me ask you something about Fox. If you could fill a chair, nobody left. But if you could fill an open chair with a, with a current NFL coach, who would that be? Who do you think would be really good in the booth? I have a feeling I know who you're going to say. McVay. I think he was McVay, just on listening to your listening to your interview with McVay. Every time I I've sat and talked to him, or you know I I've seen him interviewed, he's so smart, he's so energetic. You, you see why people people gravitate towards intelligence. They gravitate towards passion and leadership. And for a guy that walked into that building at the age that he did, you know, and you think about the. The, you know, the West Coast and from Bill Walsh to Holmgren to, you know, uh, Gruden to, you know, it, the iterations of the West Coast offense have been, I mean, he's taken that offense and run it in a totally different direction. Shanahan's taken that offense and run it in a totally different direction. And I think the guy in Green Bay is doing the same thing. So they've adapted to their players, but he's a guy that, I think could sit down and and really wow you uh, in a studio format. Another guy that's taking the West Coast offense in a different direction is McDaniel down in Miami. I think that's another one that it's like, what is this futuristic shit? And part of it is the uh, personnel. Three, three pocket rockets and yeah, having the personnel there yeah. certainly helps. But. Yeah. Um, what do you think about Brady, man? Brady, next chapter, he's going to be a co-worker. Obviously, I'm just speaking for myself. I think Greg Olson does a great job. So whoever it was uh, as the lead analyst there at Fox, it would have been killer, right? I, in in a way, I feel for Greg Olson, but that's business. It's like a draft pick that's just generational, and you slide him in, and, you know, whether it's fair or not. But I think it's going to be great, and I can't wait to see Brady in the booth. What do you think about Tom? Internally, I think he's 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 always kind of used that you know draft pick where he where he ended up going out of Michigan to his advantage. You know, I'm, I'm the guy that was overlooked. I'm you know, and and that drives him. You know, I, that's always kind of <clears throat> I think driven Tom. And you know, you you said to me when you first got to New England, Tom Brady's just the nicest guy, um, and spent time with him down in the Bahamas and. Uh, couldn't be any nicer guy, you know, just a good team. He understands. And I've, I've heard him in a conversation about, you know, what it means to be a good teammate, you know, and how important it is to be a good teammate along with someone who holds people accountable and, and all that. Tom is a smart guy. He's a passionate guy. Uh, he talks a lot about the thing, the one thing that drives success the most is your 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 willingness to work and not everyone is willing to work and i think tom is going to work his rear end off at it i would compare the the greg olson kind of ironic i would compare the greg olson thing to the quarterback situation in new england the bledsoe thing. uh you know it, luckily they can both call games though greg olson is money. is a is a great talent he did a great job Loved him as a colleague, and uh, and I think it's people are going to tune in for Tom. Uh, Tom is generally you you say well the game is what draws people, and I think that's still true. You know Dallas Philadelphia people are going to tune in to watch Dallas Philadelphia, but as an added bonus, it's like John Madden. 
you know, you got John Madden and you're watching John Madden do a football game and he brings a different element. Tom's insight into situational football, into, you know, kind of moments that he's had during his career, challenges, things that you're facing on the field in real time, he can reference. And, I, and I'm, I'm mesmerized by it. There's actually two guys, one from Fox and one from CBS that I actually tune in and think, okay, I got, I'm going to turn the volume on this game, you know, because I got the six TVs. It's Greg Olson, and uh, for a play-by-play, it's Kevin Harlan. Yeah. I love Kevin Harlan. Yeah. You know, Kevin Harlan was made to call a 36-33 game. Yep. You know, if you get to one of these crazy Chargers games and you got Kevin Harlan on the call, there's just nothing better. So I agree with you. It is about the game. But it is nice sometimes when you when you kind of get used to a certain play by play guy or um, a color commentator or the combination of the two. And that's where it really gets special to me is when two guys get a chance to work long enough together. You know, I used to, I, I really like listening to Troy and Joe, you know, when they like when they've been able to big fan of both those guys. Yeah, they're great guys and they work well together. And you can tell they, they've been working with each other for a while. And that's the stuff you like to see. I mean, there's yeah. just so much shuffling now that it becomes harder. But Every once in a while, uh, Troy laughs, and it's kind of like, you know, Troy's not a big laugher, but when he does laugh, it's it's so authentic and, you know, funny. The next guy, man, Bill Belichick. We don't know where he's working this fall, but he's going to work somewhere. What do you think about Bill getting in the media? Um, what little I've seen, Bill is, uh, you know, a natural. I mean, he's, he's comfortable in front of the camera. That whole kind of post-game press conference thing where he cultivated this, you know, curmudgeon, you know, pay the, pay the toll at the, at, to the troll at the gate. Uh, he was great at it. And I've, in what little I've seen, he's, uh, I think he's very comfortable. I think he's obviously, he's a walking encyclopedia of the history of the game and knows the game inside and out. And I think he can be, you know, if he's with someone, he could be a good team guy. And, you know, it's like with, when you've got a studio, trust is a big thing, you know, and, and I'm big on, you know, you don't need to lift, lift yourself up at somebody else's expense. Uh, you know, we need to be good teammates. We could disagree, but let's do it in a respectful way. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's going to be great. And I also think it's the scarcity of his voice that, that makes it so valuable at this point. Like yep. there were, there were 20 years there where you just couldn't get anything out of him. No. And, you know, that was that was his job at the time. But now you've got this encyclopedia that's been, you know, yeah. almost completely closed for my whole adult life. And now you're going to get to hear this guy. And I think that's going to be great. And I also think it'd be interesting to see him in an element where he doesn't have to run everything. You know, that's going to be a different deal. When you walk into a studio, you really depend on a lot of people, you know, whether it's the producers. And so would you as a head coach, but ultimately you're a teammate. You're not ultimately responsible for the product on the field. And if he's got four guys in the studio, I think he's going to do a great job. And I think it'd be fun for him to kind of be able to just be a part of the team and not, and not yeah, the guy that's got to call the shots. There. There's a camaraderie there for sure. You know what I mean? I think you might see a different side of him. Uh, all right. Last thing I want to ask you about with football, man, Hassan Reddick was holding out. I don't really care about the holdout or the Jets. No offense right now. I more care about his cool Japanese outfit he was wearing. And it reminded me of the fact that you guys had played in uh, in Japan at one point. Didn't y'all play in Tokyo against the Saints? I got this old poster in, in the house. We played in Japan. Uh, we played both games in the preseason. We played in London, played in Japan. I did broadcasting in Afghanistan, Dublin, and uh, Sydney. So what do you think? You think the game can go global? And what was it like back in the day? Because now it's like the NFL's got it dialed in. It's like a 10-pole event. You, you you roll up. They got signage everywhere. You got Tom Brady and Geno Smith on the water towers in Frankfurt. And you've got a game they're talking about doing in Dublin. And I'm sure it'd be hooked up. I would love to go to a Dublin game. But what was it like playing in Japan and London back in the day? And do you think the, the NFL's on to something here? It was uh, aside from the travel because you know you're you're one you're traveling a long distance. Yeah, like what do you do on the plane from the West Coast? It was 
you know, I, I just pulled a Russell Wilson. I ran 40s, you know. On the <laughs> um, you know, Russ, I just worked out the whole way. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. But, you know, it was odd because your clock's off. We're on the West Coast. We're playing in London. You get off the plane. You go right to practice. There was a heat wave in London. No air conditioning, no ice. As a matter of fact, Bill Bacall and I, your godfather, we brought you to a pub uh, over there in London, the Running Footman. Whoever goes to London, go to the Running Footman because it was the only place that had ice they would put in glasses. Oh, nice. Yeah, because they don't do ice over there. Yeah. yeah, so we sat there at the front outside with you. Uh, I got a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah you've seen that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. Japan, was, Japan was really wild for me. You, you really, England felt like Boston because, you know, I, we grew up, I grew up in New England. So Boston is like, kind of like London without the accent. Japan was, you know, the sumo wrestlers came to practice. You know, we got to meet them and we, you know, messed around with them. Uh, London, they kind of, they didn't know when to clap. They didn't know when to, you know, get excited, but they were enthusiastic and we played at old Wembley Stadium the old Wembley Stadium before the new Wembley Stadium. And then we played at the Tokyo Dome, I think, in in uh, Japan. So it, they were interesting trips, but I couldn't imagine it during the season. It was, it's, it has to be a, a challenge. And I'm sure they've got it down pat now in what to do. They travel better. They, you know, they understand recovery better. They have physical therapists. They have whatever. We didn't have anything. I just don't know what y'all did on the planes, man. All right. Last thing. We're going to try this segment on for sides. It's explain things to my dad. Okay. Um, we have a couple current topics that Cowboy Reed has come up with. Uh, and I've got to explain to you what's going on with these trends okay. or these, uh, these happenings. Olympic uh, in France, these French citizens are shitting, excuse me, going to the bath bathroom, defecating in the water where they're going to swim. Have you heard about this? No. I'm in okay, Montana. So, I'm yeah, in you're Montana. right. You're not very <laughs> online. This is why this yeah, segment I'm works. Like, Read the paper. Do you know the Olympics are coming up? Yes. The only thing I know about the Olympics is that poor gal in the 800 meter race fell right before the end, and she was the gold medalist in the last Olympics. She's not going in, and Nike had some issues with the uh, the athletes' uniforms. Well, there's some issues with the Parisians. It's in Paris, right? Okay. Yeah. So the Olympics are in Paris. We're off to a good start. It uh, There's a lot of water events where people swim, like triathlons and, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not the Michael Phelps type thing because they got pools for sure, that. Yeah. But there's some waterways. It would be like if the Olympics came to Montana and people were swimming in Flathead Lake during the events. Yeah. Okay. So to protest, these French people are taking massive dumps in the Seine River to protest sewage contamination ahead of 2024 Summer Olympics. So I don't think it's the issue being that the, the fact that like Olympians are swimming in their waterways, they think it's gonna contaminate their waterways, so they're shitting in the water. It's not a very French thing to do. I don't, you know, I don't know what, I the norms of France are not uh, right for <laughs> yeah, I don't know if this is the norm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe... Uh, How would you feel if the Olympics were coming to town? Are you taking a dump in the... You know, Chris, we, we live in a really, really different world now. The Olympics came to L.A., though, when you played? Yeah. Um, do you remember it? Yeah, I, I do remember it. Mom went. I didn't go. They read, matter of fact, they had something at the uh, Coliseum. I think they had some of the races at the Coliseum and maybe uh, the shot put and the javelin or whatever. Uh, Would you have done shot put if you had to? Would that have been your event? Probably javelin or the, dis or the discus. I threw the discus and shot put and javelin in high school. All right, Reed, next one. So, Howie, we've got these dude retreats. All these guys are going to certain locations to become men. So the dude retreats, Dad, I'm sure you haven't seen this, but there are guys paying six figures to go to these boot camps where – these guys that look like Navy SEALs, but might not be Navy SEALs, some military, some just guys with don't tread on me uh, license plates. But they basically get these guys to yell at them 
and rough them up for a couple of days and belittle them. It's basically like a frat hazing thing, but for these guys that don't feel like they're alpha males, so they got to spend money to go to these boot camps and get the shit kicked out of them. Not really the shit kicked out of them, Reed. You just learn how to be a man. What do you think about these man camps? <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure you got, you're going to get that that alpha male at a camp uh, <laughs> midway through your young adult life. Uh, that's one. Two is I never, ever, ever understood the fraternity thing. Yeah. So I'm going to wait. Let me get this straight. I'm going to join your group, pay money, and you're going to abuse me for six weeks. And then you're going to be my friend. I'm going to kick your ass at the end of the six weeks. <laughs> and I might kick your ass in the middle of everything else. Yeah, exactly. You might not wait that long. No. So, so you're no on the dude retreat. So am I. No, no, no. If I need to send you somewhere to toughen you up, I mean, hey, listen, I toughened you up on one thing. I took you to Ben D'Alessandro. He was a basketball coach who I knew could run you into the ground. And, you know, you said you wanted to do this. And I said, okay, let's, let's figure it out. And I didn't want to be the one to do it. And I wanted to indoctrinate you into what it was going to be like at an extreme. And, and you survived. Uh, you, you didn't wilt. Well, there are ways, suffice to say, to toughen your kids up so that when they don't get old, when they get older, they don't have to pay six figures to be right. belittled by a bunch of strangers with Instagram followings. Uh, I, look, I look at Whalen and I go, golly, I mean, the change in him. He's oh, getting tough. Oh, God. I, You know. The other day there was blood and he was just sitting there. I walked over and he's like, there's blood. And I'm like, all right. It's okay to cry and it's okay to be hurt for sure. But like the, we all know there are times when like, you know, the crying is elective. And uh, and that's one of those times. And so when when you see that, you're like, okay, we're on the right track. I love those boys. God, I love. Yeah, them. they're great. All right, Howie. Last one. Males, short kings, as we call them, are looking into leg lengthening surgeries to gain height. So there are basically these leg lengthening surgeries that are gaining popularity among men seeking to be taller. Basically, they're putting rods in their legs to make them taller. And I'm curious. If you could pay for one of these surgeries for somebody who is on the Fox set, who would it be? Oh, Jake Laser. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jay, Jay looks in the mirror at home, and it's a carnival mirror. You know, <laughs> carnival mirrors make you look make you look tall and thin. Jay, Jay is uh, he looks at that carnival mirror in the morning. He tightens his tie up and he says. I'm going to go out and conquer the world. Jay looks in the mirror in the in his bathroom and he's looking he's at the faucet. He's 6'3". <laughs> he, he can't see them. He's looking eye to eye with the faucet. Look, I'm not I'm not judging. I don't know about you, but I don't really notice that people are short. Me neither. I always tell guys this. I'm like, bro, like you, you got to chill with this because I'm not really paying attention. I, the only thing I notice is if somebody's 6'5 or 6'6 six, six or 6'7, six, they're at my level or higher. I I kind of take notice because I tend. Yeah. To now imagine if you were walking around and everybody was six seven, you'd be like a little bit insecure. I think. Yeah, that's and, where and short and kings are coming and that's, from. That's where I'm getting to. To my point is this: I'm not going to judge them. I I can't. I'm not walking in their shoes. You know, you I'm couldn't, not. You couldn't fit in them. No. <laughs> yeah. You know. They can shop at the the best places still, though. And That's can, the thing. There's a lot of positives to being small. You can fit in tight, tight spaces. You know, um, you go to a restaurant. There's a tight table, short seat. It's like you know, that's it's a yeah, chance. yeah. The only cool thing about being taller, we got shorter lifespans, which isn't great. But like, we can reach shit off the top shelf, which really means we get asked to do more stuff. You do. So, honestly, being short, I kind of wish there was a leg shortening surgery i might do that one i'm uh, jay, I, hey jay we'll, we'll hey, jay we'll get that hooked up for you <laughs> you and i'll cover it yeah we'll cover it yeah we'll cover it uh <laughs> he'd do it he'd post it on instagram oh he would yeah he would uh all right well that that's that that'll do it for today we covered a lot of ground uh it feels good to have a pod in the uh 
in the hopper here. And uh, as of Wednesday afternoon, I don't know whenever we get it out, we will be on the road in the RV. Dad will be in the water in Montana taking a shit to. to I got in. Yes, I got in yesterday. It's like fifty nine degrees. I got in yesterday. Oh, uh, that's awesome! Well, I can't wait to get there. She was, um, she was on the staircase. I got in the water, and I said, "Look, I could have a heart attack. Just get me out of the water." I'm not looking for you to revive me. Just get me out of the water. That's going to be a challenge. Yeah. Uh, but enjoy that water. And uh, we will be on the road very shortly. But thanks for joining us, Dad. Love, Love you, man. you. Love you. Thanks for coming on. And uh, we'll get you back on soon. Okay, bud.